All right. Good morning. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. It is April 15th, 2021. And today we're going to be uh, taking testimony on H-171, uh, the child care bill, which um, we're hoping to work on and to move as early as next week, early next week. So um, thank you all for being here to provide testimony. Uh, let's see who is first on the list. Um, Sarah Truckle and Sarah Truckle just popped in. Where are you? Um, there you are, right. Sarah. Thank you for being here. Um, there's a lot in the bill relating to um, child care financing, and you are the expert from the department uh, from DCF on this. So uh, we welcome your testimony. Do you have anything for us on our documents list? Um, I don't. And if it's actually okay, I am. Um... Is it possible that the interim deputy commissioner could kind of give an overview of our department's testimony and then I could chime in on the financial sections? Absolutely. We, we would scary. welcome that. And so, and I don't know that uh, Miranda Gray, your interim deputy commissioner, has been here uh, since you were appointed. So thank you for being here, uh, Com deputy commissioner Gray. Why don't you unmute yourself and... Uh, introduce yourself to the committee and then you can give us the the overview so thanks for being here thank you so much for having me <clears throat> so i am Mar for the record i am miranda gray i'm the interim deputy commissioner for the child development division and i appreciate you providing the time for us um, to come and testify on H-171 today. I have with me Melissa Regal Garrett, our policy director for the Child Development Division. And then as you know, Sarah Treckle, who is our DCF financial director. Overall, the administration supports the concept of the bill and supports the three studies and two advisory groups as outlined. However, there are still sections of the bill that we'd like to touch upon today. Those are section four, appropriations and legislative intent, child care financial assistance program. Section six through eight, the workforce supports. Sections 10 and 11, the ARPA working groups. And section 12, report child care financial assistance program, program enrollment model. Um, with this general overview of what we'd like to touch upon, I'd like to turn over testimony to Melissa Regal Garrett. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, uh, Melissa, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Uh, for the record, my name is Melissa Regal Garrett. I am the policy director for the Child Development Division, and uh, it's a pleasure to be back. And um, I want to start by thanking all of you for your leadership and partnership over the last year as the state uh, has engaged in the COVID response period uh, and all the support for um, child care and early learning programs. Uh, it sure has been a year and the field has demonstrated its resiliency and also its uh, significant importance uh, in terms of caring for our kids and families and also uh, supporting our economy. So uh, much appreciated uh, the work over the last year. Uh, as Deputy Commissioner Gray stated, overall, the administration is in support of the concept of achieving access to affordable quality child care for all Vermont families who need it. Um, the administration also recognizes and appreciates the changes to this bill from the introduced version to the House passed version. Um, we do appreciate your time hearing some final areas of concern. Um, and uh, as I go through this, I am uh, going to reference the bill. And I'm curious if you all are using the official version or the unofficial version as you are um, uh, looking at the bill. Uh, we'll, we'll be using the official version. Great, thank you. I'm gonna start uh, in section four, which uh, is page 46 of the official version. Uh, this is the appropriations and legislative intent related to the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. Um, the administration is recommending a strike of the intent number two, uh, as it is in the financing study section, uh, and we support it being there. Um, and at the very least, a removal of the date of October 1st of 2021 uh, in this particular section. Uh, Melissa, um, if, I could ask, if, if I could ask for you to just slow down and remind us where you are in the beginning, because once we all get on that page, then we uh, then 
then let the reins go. All right. Sounds good. So okay. let me know when you all have found me on page 46. <laughs> How are we doing committee? So page 46 and the section that you're talking about is? Section four. Section four on page 46. Okay. So committee, when you get there. Madam Chair, I just want to note that the, the unofficial version is the one that doesn't have the, the cross outs and the strikes. So and let's that's go on page four. Yes. I think Melissa's on page four of the unofficial. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Because I was yeah. on page four also and then look going back. Okay, so let's do that. Page four. Great. Um, so again, I'm looking at um, section number two. Uh, under section four. Um, okay. And we're actually asking that uh, this is this section is uh, struck um, from this section because uh, it actually appears in the financing study section. Um, and at the very least, a removal of the date of October 1 of 2021 um, for this section. Um, and the reason for this is um, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program five year plan. Uh, really takes a very different philosophical approach to setting a family's copayment. Um, the administration studied this pretty significantly before presenting the five-year plan, um, now almost uh, two to three years ago. Um, and what we base uh, these copayments on is actually uh, the Joint Fiscal Office's basic needs budget. Um, and assuming that a family has access uh, to what's in that basic needs budget, we set the copayment based on whatever a family could afford for out-of-pocket child care. Uh, in other words, what they earn over and above that basic needs budget. Um, and again, um, it's, it's a fairly significant difference from setting it based on a 10% threshold. Um, and while uh, we provided testimony to House Human Services that they're fairly aligned uh, as you move up the income scale is at the very higher end of the income scale where you see, um, you know, the copayments we've set go above the 10% uh, threshold that this bill is interested in. Um, and the two uh, approaches don't really work together. And uh, so what we'd really like is for this to have an opportunity to be fully studied. And if this is in fact uh, the philosophical approach that the state would like to take, um, you know, that, that we would be able to explore that and understand the ramifications of that, uh, both financially as well as policy-wise uh, before implementing it. Um, and so um, that's, that's why we'd like to see this removed or at the very least, uh, the date removed. Madam Chair, can I ask a clarifying question on this? Yes, go ahead, okay. please. Melissa, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have a chart maybe that shows the differences on, on what what you're talking about? Because um, without looking at the numbers, it's hard for me to understand what the difference between what, what we're seeing versus the approach you're suggesting or the, the current approach. Um, I believe that we can uh, find that for you. There was uh, a chart presented to House Human Services. So I think that we can um, snag that from that submitted testimony and uh, get that to you, Senator Hardy. That would be great. Thanks. Yeah, please just send it into Nellie and she'll post it on our webpage. Thank. That would be great. Great. Essentially, what happens is when you get at higher levels of income for families um, up in the um, above 300, 350 percent of the federal poverty level, that's where you really start to hit um, uh, co-pays that we have set. Uh, based on the basic needs budget uh, uh, that are higher or either at or higher the 10% uh, threshold that this bill uh, is looking at. Um, and certainly as you get to higher and higher income levels, uh, the consideration to go to potentially 400%, um, you know, that, that gets exacerbated as you go uh, up. Um, and so there is actually a, a philosophical uh, conversation to be had about families that are earning higher levels of income um, above the JFO basic need budget and what is their fair cost share um, in a market-based system um, and what is fair uh, for the state to bear um, as we move forward um, uh, considering this bill. 
Um, and then I will um, uh, defer to my colleague, Sarah uh, Truckle, if she wants to mention anything in terms of budgetary impacts. Let's let's hold uh, put a hold there uh, and let Senator Hooker ask her question. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Um, and you talked about the date, at least changing the date. And do you have a suggestion for that? Um, we'd love to just see the date left out uh, and allow the financing committee to do its work and bring its recommendations back to the legislature um, and then be able to make a determination at that point of when an, an effective date would make sense if we're going to move to this uh, this way of approaching a cost share for families. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. So now you wanted Sarah Truckle to weigh in. Okay. Sarah Truckle, DCF Financial Director for the record. I would also add that two is not currently um, within the FY22 governor proposed budget. So in section 4A, the 5.529 million lines up with the FY22 proposed budget and the governor's proposed CCFAP year three flip. Uh, that does not include the costs associated with um, section 4 B2. So there would be an additional financial cost. The other point um, that I would add here is just that the governor's original budget language did include that 5.5 million. Um, so that in the House proposed, it strikes that from our budget language and moves it and carries it in this bill, um, which creates the question of does it actually add to the base or is it one time in nature? And there's just some technical clarifications that. Um, would be important to ensure because this shift would require this appropriation within the base. Uh, thank you for that. And just FYI, um, the the money sections of the bill we're going to we're we're not going to tamper too much with the money in the bill. That is really the appropriations committee's work. So we'll we'll hold that. But thank you for that. And that'll that'll help us when we meet with appropriations. All right, uh, I'm going to move um, to the workforce sections, um, section six, which uh, I believe in the version you're looking at begins on page five. Yep. Um, I just have uh, some general comments here uh, on behalf of the administration. Um, the administration absolutely recognizes the need to support the child care workforce, uh, and we uh, currently are providing funds to support higher education for those currently working in the field. Um, and you've got Sonia Raymond here, who's uh, part of the TEACH program, which uh, is the program that receives those funds. So I uh, look forward to hearing her um, help you better understand that. Um, but uh, there are a couple of concerns uh, with this section, and you may have already noted these concerns. Uh, the expansion of the current program, uh, as well as establishment of a new scholarship program for prospective workforce and the establishment of the loan repayment program does provide an appropriation that's not currently within uh, the governor's FY22 proposed budget. Um, and then it also seems to outline an intent that it's funded in future years as well. And then the other piece I want uh, to just flag for the legislature, while it's less of a barrier, uh, we do wanna have it noted that operationalizing two new programs uh, could potentially take us up to around nine months uh, to allow for the establishment of the policies and guidelines and procedures, as well as uh, to run a procurement process uh, if that is uh, the direction we move. So I just want the legislature to be aware that as we are establishing new programs and operationalizing that at the administrative level, uh, that there is some time involved uh, with getting programs up and running. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next I'm gonna uh, go to sections 10 and 11, uh, which are the ARPA working groups. Um, and uh, those begin on page 12. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we do support uh, the working groups established in these sections um, and uh, uh, look forward to working with folks and making recommendations uh, on expending the ARPA funding streams. Uh, in accordance with federal law and the allowable uses. Um, we do have concerns with utilizing ARPA funding 
to raise the CCFAP income limit to 400% of the federal poverty level, as well as um, moving copayments uh, to the 10% threshold uh, for a family's income level. Um, in addition to some of the things I mentioned earlier um, and the potential additional uh, base budget pressures that this could put on, um, well, it, it actually is that. Uh, using ARPA funding in this case does create a potential base budget pressure in the future uh, if we are going to look to potentially continue uh, the cost of these. So they're not one-time in nature expenditures, uh, and the federal dollars are one-time in nature. Um, so, um, uh, and, you know, as I mentioned before, it is a major policy shift for how the five-year plan is designed. Uh, and the working group itself that's established for the, this purpose isn't really designed or has the time to do the kind of analysis needed to determine if the policy shift is, in fact, uh, the right way to go uh, for Vermont and this program. So, yes, so um, thank you uh, uh, for that. Was there, did someone else have a comment? No, okay. Um, did, were you, were you ready to stop there? That's. I have one, one more piece on this section, right. which is um, we are building uh, the CBDIS, the child care information system, the new um, technology that we'll be using already. Uh, and we are building it based on uh, the methodology that we have used to determine family copay. Uh, so to make an, a shift in October of 2021, um, we'll actually um, interrupt uh, the work that we're doing to launch that system. Um, and uh, the timing of this decision, uh, if we leave it with the work group, um, it, it, will, it will be a... Um, a bit of a rub uh, between the two uh, pieces of work that we're trying to accomplish. Okay, that that's helpful. Um, so I guess the uh, this is uh, is that the November deadline that you're talking about in the bill. The reporting of this group is November, and that would conflict with the work that's ongoing on the IT system. That is so. Correct. Yes. Okay. So then I'm also looking at the, 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 what the group is doing and um, it's a, there's a lot, there's going to, there's a huge amount in ARPA that is about childcare block grants, CCFAP. I mean, it's, there's a huge amount in there. And I'm wondering if, uh, you know, we're turning it all over to bright futures, um, DCF, and I, I'm, I'm interested in thinking about having some relationship with uh, the Joint Fiscal Office uh, in some way so that there's a more of a, a collaborative environment uh, and then the work that's coming back to the legislature is somehow um, integrated with our Joint Fiscal folks. So just, just to let you know, I'm thinking about that and how we might um, have something in place there. Okay, uh, Senator Hardy. Thank you, um, Melissa. So I'm looking at the language that you were talking about. Is, so my impression is that this group was just to make recommendations that just because they recommend something doesn't mean it's gonna happen. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, is it is it your concern because this would require, this group would require more work for CDD or you're concerned about what they might recommend, or are you, I, I, I guess I just want a little bit more clarity on the concerns about sort of where along the line the concerns mm -hmm. I are. Think, I, I mean, think, I hear you about the more money. <laughs> right, so I think ahead, that sorry. Uh, um, the, the, yeah, no, the two major concerns uh, that we have is that um, this is the ARPA money is one-time money and the use of that money uh, for something that would require ongoing investment by the state um, and, the, and placing that responsibility to make that decision, both financially and philosophically, with this particular work group. We haven't structured this work group to have the capacity or the skill set to do that study. That's why we put it in the financing study and placed it with, um, you know, JFO to really guide that um, 
uh, it's complex. Uh, you know, the, this decision is, is pretty deep and complex. It's going to require some significant analysis of what is that um, actual impact of using one model versus the other um, and asking the folks that are going to be involved in this work group um, who aren't necessarily financial people uh, to be doing that kind of analysis um, seems a little bit uh, unfair to them as well as um, those of us that are going to get these recommendations and have to actually uh, work within those recommendations to make final decisions. Okay, that makes sense. I do want to point out that they are recommendations. We can, the legislature would have to make the final decision. This group would not have the ability to do anything besides recommend. And, you know, we reject recommendations all the time. <laughs> you know that. So that, that's just one thing. But I, but I do understand your concerns um, for sure. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Sarah, this is a, this is touched a bit on finances. Is there anything else that you would want to add? I think you've highlighted the uh, potential impact around one using one-time funds. Uh, as you, as this committee knows from the past, when we've increased uh, FPL as well as uh, shifting in rates, the economic and the fiscal impact is quite uh, substantial. So, for example. Uh, this year we're shifting and doing the flip and that's a cost of 5.5 million with the current um, with the expected underutilization. So just to highlight that it is an, uh, a minimal impact that we would potentially be looking at for recommendations using one time funds, but that it would have a sizable future potential obligation. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, the distinction right. between one time and base funding is constantly on our minds so thank you all right all right the final section that um uh comments from the administration is section 12 um and that's on page 16 um and it's the report uh for um uh, dcf to do on the child care financial assistance program and the enrollment based model um the department uh, remains uh, in support of studying this change uh, as it's a complex change uh, and won't only have financial implications. Um, for example, it's not currently in the FY22 proposed budget, but it also has policy implications that need to be fully understood and weighed uh, in order to make a fully informed decision uh, about moving in this way. Um, I'd also like to provide the committee some information about Vermont's current system. Uh, in our uh, Child Care Financial Assistance Program state plan, which is where we report to the feds exactly how we operationalize this program, Vermont's billing system is, in fact, uh, an enrollment-based system. Um, essentially, we are a hybrid of an enrollment model based on attendance. Um, we chose this approach. Um, and we implemented very liberal policies around this approach uh, in order to strike a balance between flexibility for families, reliability for programs, and accountability as stewards of taxpayer dollars. Moving from this hybrid approach that we currently employ to a true enrollment-based system uh, really requires an examination not only of the cost, but the level of comfort we have as a state with the integrity that will be lost as improper payments will increase uh, and there will not be checks and balances um, that we have currently built into the system uh, to prevent that. Vermont is one of 18 states that reported in their pre-COVID CCDF state plans that they were using an enrollment-based billing system. Of those 18 states, only six reflect a true enrollment-based policy. Of those six, all of them require attendance be kept either through their licensing or their CCFAP attendance policies. Two of those six require attendance is submitted when billing is made for payment for the system. What Vermont changed during the closure period last year was not actually our payment policy we remained an enrollment based on attendance system. The families in our program 
that are essential were were children of essential workers continued to have attendance submitted on their behalf and the program the program ran per usual families whose children were not allowed to attend care due to the governor's order also still had attendance submitted on their behalf uh, they used a code um, that enabled us to pay them uh, even though uh, children were not attending care um, and that ensured that there was in fact a space for those kids to return to um, when their care provider reopened. The administration fully understands the ongoing budgetary pressures of all child care programs as we remain in the COVID response period and move into the recovery phase. Because the subsidy system only makes up 20% of the regulated system, it really is not the way to go to stabilize child care during our COVID response. Rather, Vermont's created and invested millions of dollars in COVID response financial support programs intended to support restart of programs and also specifically to make up the difference in operating revenue from pre-COVID times. All regulated programs open and operating were able to apply for those funding opportunities. How our policies find a balance between flexibility for families, reliability for programs, and accountability as steward of taxpayer dollars uh, really falls into three categories. In order to support families' access to childcare for their authorized service needs, we base that on a parent's schedule, and families are authorized using a part-time, a full-time, or an extended care schedule. So if you are a family working part-time and you work seven to 10 on Monday through Friday, while you may only have a 15 hour work schedule, you're actually approved a part-time certificate, which is, allows 25 hours of childcare. This approach allows for the parents to use a program to meet the child and family's needs and the hours of childcare can be used to determine between the family and the childcare provider based on the needs of that family. In an attendance-based system, how this looks is families are authorized for specific hours based on the parent's work or training hours. So that same family would be authorized to access care between seven and 10 in the morning. They may be allowed additional half an hour or an hour on either side for travel, but the specific hours are what uh, are expected and they are what is paid for. In a true enrollment based system, CARES authorized either based on specific hours or based on um, variable hours. So uh, it's flexible how that looks. Are there questions on that aspect before I move on no, to I, how we try to do reliability I, for programs? There certainly will be questions, but I think what it would be extremely helpful is to have your testimony in writing so we can uh, fully appreciate what it is that we're hearing. A lot of what you're Absolutely. saying sounds like um, uh, rules and guidance documents for child care providers. I'm sure we could dip into the rules a little bit as we've done in the past, but uh, so if you can provide this in writing and Nellie will put it up on our web page, that would be terrific. Absolutely. All right. This Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Melissa, um, I totally agree. Having it in writing would be helpful. Um, but I'm also wondering if you or wait, can you guys hear me? I'm getting that internet in connection unstable message. <laughs> okay. You're fine. Um, You're fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> Tell me if I start to sound weird. I um, uh, wonder if you or Sarah have any kind of, you know, analysis of this, just a quick analysis of the financial difference between doing the attendance-based or enrollment-based, you know, how much more would it cost if we were to go to enrollment-based? I see Sarah unmuted, so I'll let her go ahead. So we were asked the same question from the House, and um, there's kind of two complicating factors. 
One is that um, in order for us to do that estimate, we actually need the flip to occur because it shifts that estimate. Um, and two, we know that it costs more money because we saw an uptick in our expenses that happened at the end of uh, last year during the governor's closure period. But that was under a different set of framework because we're completely flipping the system in October and shifting to this family copay and going to 2019 uh, at the 50th percentile for rates, there isn't a way for us to estimate what it would look like until we do that flip under the new CCFAB year three. Um, okay. So I can tell you it will cost more because I know it will, but um, if I told you what the difference was last year, it would be under a completely different framework and it wouldn't correspond to what, what it would look like this coming year. So, okay. so last, that, I uh, guess the, um, sorry. Well, Madam Chair, could I finish? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I, I hear you, this is complicated and I, I get that it's complicated. I'm wondering though, if it might be beneficial to actually get this study. Um, and I think if the date doesn't work, we could certainly consider a different date for when the studies do, but it, it might be helpful for all of us to understand what the difference is and having the official study would help lay it out, I think, because um, just hearing Melissa's explanation, and I am a finance person, I, you know, it is hard to follow it without having the full context and the full study. So, you know, we're hearing from a lot of childcare providers that this would make a big difference, and we did see it, even though it might not be an apples to apples comparison, we did see it make a big difference in during COVID. Um, so as, as much as I think I hear your concerns, I think having the study would be really, really helpful. I think perhaps um, I wasn't clear when I started, Senator Hardy and I apologize. Um, the administration is fully supportive of doing the study that's outlined in this oh, okay. bill and we are fine with the timeline in it. I'm actually responding to testimony that you've heard uh, in the last couple of weeks about a request to not study this, but actually implement it immediately. And the administration's position is I see. this is okay. so complicated that it absolutely needs to be studied um, before we make decisions about moving forward with it. Yes, okay. thank you. Thank you, Melissa. That's helpful. I thought you were not done, didn't want to do the study. And I was like, but this seems like a study kind of thing. So, all right, thank you. That's helpful. So mm -hmm. the testimony we heard, of course, was that during the uh, pandemic, COVID from, I believe it was March to June uh, last year, that there was a full enrollment-based coverage from our CRF CARES funds, I forget which one now, but, uh, but that was extremely uh, helpful in keeping um, positions open for kids and also keeping childcare facilities open. Sarah. Right. Um, yeah, technically though, we didn't shift systems. Um, we right. employed a code uh, in our attendance-based system that allowed us to pay for children um, while those programs were closed. Um, and essentially right now, uh, even if we um, continue to do that, uh, what's happened as the system is reopened is many families and programs actually don't have these kids still enrolled in their programs. Um, so we've dug into um, a handful of programs and what we're seeing is that um, they may have half the actual children certificates uh, that are still with them. So whether we remained uh, on that, um, that approach that we took during closure or not right now, um, if the kids aren't actually enrolled in, in, a, in a program, we aren't going to be paying on behalf of those families. Um, and those are family decisions. They're either taking their children um, to places that um, are operating five days a week um, full time because that's what they need, or they are um, shifting their hours to a part time certificate instead of a full time certificate. Um, and that's resulting, of course, in loss of, of operating revenue. Um, and and those families are making those decisions whether they're on subsidy or not. Um, and it's why we created and designed the, the operational relief grant program that we ran last fall. Um, our CURSA program that we just closed the applications for and we had 
over 70% of providers apply for funds through that. Um, again, was designed to help fill that operating revenue gap. Um, so, um, you know, I, I would just say, like, we haven't ignored that this is an issue as a state. Vermont um, has led the nation in ensuring that our child care system has been supported financially through this, uh, this crisis. And um, uh, we just haven't chosen to do it through the subsidy system. We've chosen to do it um, through these other um, mechanisms that apply across the board, whether a family is on subsidy or it's a private pay uh, scenario for the reason for the loss for programs. Uh, thank you. Th thanks for all that. Uh, and, you know, the, the struggle is to keep uh, our child care centers open, uh, even when the kids are not there, uh, when they're coming back. It's, it's, it's very much, I, I don't want to prolong the conversation, but it, it kind of reminds me of uh, having a school building and teachers there, but uh, fewer kids. So you got to keep the infrastructure going. So, but so having the analysis, I Agreed. think, would be very helpful. Yeah, I know it's a tough one. It's a, it's a really a tough it is one. It is, it is very tough, and I think you know the the significant difference between childcare being a market based system and you know the public school being a publicly funded system. Um, it it really creates uh, some very different uh, barriers and things that we need to pay close attention to. Um, ramifications of policy change. Um, have ripple effects that can impact private pay families, um, probably not in this case, but uh, in other aspects of this bill um, that we really need to fully understand um, before we pull that trigger, um, unless we're able to go to a fully universal system, which I think we're probably not, uh, it, it, is a, it is a high price tag to get there. So um, uh, I would just say that you, the committee mentioned some pieces around uh, child absences last week. And if I could just talk a little bit about, you know, currently we do require providers to submit attendance, but we have a significant uh, number of codes that uh, providers are able to use uh, if um, families are absent. Um, and those include um, uh, provider closed days. So if a provider chooses to be closed, there are up to 15 of those that they can use annually. Um, if a child is sick, uh, there's unlimited uh, sick codes that can be used for those, those kiddos. Um, and we've extended that to COVID quarantine or um, other things, um, decisions by the family um, to be used during this response period. Uh, in addition to that, uh, families can take up to 10 days a year of vacation. Um, and then one other final policy that we have that's really significant is if a child attends one hour of care in a week, we pay the full week on behalf of a provider. So a provider can literally put in attendance of one hour on any day at any point during a day of a week. Uh, and we pay out the full rate of that allowable certificate. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Sarah, did you wanna add anything or uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Gray? The only piece that I would add around what we did last spring is that in addition to allowing uh, this shift during the governor's closure period for CCFAP. We also, through the child care stabilization program, covered the tuition of um, all families uh, at that 50%. And if a child was unenrolled, we covered it at 100%. So it was a very different time where we were effectively covering the tuition of the system during that closure period um, in recognition that unless you were an essential worker, that that care wasn't being provided. So that didn't just impact the CCFAP system, but it also did significantly impact the private pay system and really stabilize providers on uh, both sides because CCFAP is only, I believe, 20% of our overall system. Okay, thank you. And so as, as we asked for previously to get this information in writing, it would be extremely helpful. Okay, Senator Hardy has a question. 
I just have a comment, um, and specifically to Melissa, um, because when I saw you pop up on the screen, I sort of got a flashback to a year ago and the many, many conversations we had as um, everyone was scrambling to try to figure this out. And um, I know you were working a bazillion hours. I'm sure everybody was, but I specifically talked to you a lot. So I just um, wanted to thank you and your whole team for all the work you've done over the last year, because I know it's been really hard. So thank you. I think as hard as it was for us, um, I can't even imagine what it was like being on the ground uh, as a childcare program reopening under, um, you know, real restrictive health guidance, uh, ensuring health and safety of those kids and families um, and the ongoing work that they have just done um, over the course of the last year uh, under those circumstances. So thank you very much, Senator Hardy, but um, really the kudos go out to the field. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I completely I agree. Think, I, you had a, a role in that too. So I think the kudos go across the board and it, it's been a difficult time and that Vermont has done so well as a testament to you folks as well as uh, people out in the on the ground. So thank you. I agree. Um, so any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, Thank you for your testimony, and we look forward to having it um, on our web page. I know it may seem like extra work, but I'm, I think you've already done some of this, yes, and uh, so we'll, we'll look for it. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for being here. And so we're going to move on to um, Sonia Ray Raymond, who's here. Um, so welcome back, and why don't you introduce yourself for the record? Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me this morning. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, for the record, Sonia Raymond. Um, I have a dual role. I um, work for the Vermont AEYC. Um, I oversee programs such as Teach um, and other scholarship programs and funds um, to support early educators. And I also own a program in Stowe, Vermont, early childhood program. And again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so uh, we all agree that quality early childhood has been essential to our economy. Um, but in these times that we've been through, accessing the early childhood education has become actually imperative and providing stability for the families that um, these programs are serving and ensuring the health and growth of development of the children is um, paramount. Um, so when the pandemic hit and many people were working from home, um, as was mentioned, there was a portion of our population, the essential workers, um, for whom that was not even possible. And um, early childhood education programs stopped, stepped up, reopened um, their businesses and served the families. Um, and it was really all of you in the legislature that we have to thank um, that really led the nation, honestly, in supporting these programs um, until the state um, could reopen in some capacity. Um, so I just really wanna thank you for your leadership. Um, it's been amazing. Well, we're gonna thank you as well. Uh, we all work very hard to make these things happen and we greatly appreciate that recognition for our work. Yeah, it, it takes a village, as they say. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, it's, but it's also, you know, never been more clear that an investment in early education isn't only just key to our economic health, but it's going to provide the very foundation necessary for young children to develop into these well-rounded, happy, productive members of our society. Um, and as before the pandemic, the very existence of early education is in jeopardy. Um, families can't afford early education. Um, some paying as much as 30% of their household income, even with state assistance. And early childhood educators um, not being able to make a living, basically, the median wage right now is $14.80 an hour. Um, and often this is without health insurance. So program capacity has continued to decrease and challenges with hiring and retaining early educators has really reached a crisis point. Um, without specific and targeted investments being fully realized, we're going to continue to see this decline. Um, the quality of early education programs begins and ends really with well-qualified early educators and program leadership. 
So unless we ensure that there are affordable entry points into this profession and the resources for those that are currently in the workforce and proper compensation for this important work that educators do, we will not be able to stop the exodus of early educators out of the field and we will not be able to attract new early educators either. So addressing affordability for families also must be a top priority for us. We can't hope to have a strong economy if families can't afford to go to work. Um, yet this is really the reality that our we are facing at this point. Um, most families now face really difficult choices. You know, do I work and support my family when the majority of my paycheck is going um, for early education um, services, or do I stay home and begin accessing other social supports for my family? Um, so we at Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children really support strongly um, H171, which calls for several key actions and investments that are the first steps necessary to addressing the affordability and accessibility um, to quality early education for our working families. We also have a few suggestions for how the bill could be changed to better support Vermont's children and families, in addition to Vermont's early educators as well. Um, we'd like to highlight just a, our support for some of the components that you'll see in um, the testimony that I sent. Um, one is affordability and accessibility. So H171 keeps us on the path toward achieving a five-year redesign plan for the Child Care Financial Assistance Program um, that was just discussed which continues to incrementally address family affordability. In 2021, that means aligning CFAP federal poverty guidelines with 2021 federal poverty guidelines, expanding income eligibility from 300% of the federal poverty level to 350% and extending full financial assistance to families earning up to 150% of the federal poverty level and changing how family contributions are structured from a per child payment to a family co-payment. All of these changes coupled together will have an immediate and positive impact on Vermont families. These investments are crucial now and um, we all also understand and know that further changes in CCFAP are needed over time that move us from reimbursements to programs being based on a market rate of cost um, to a cost of care structure where families pay no more than 10% of their household income. And these changes when fully implemented will mean that the 70% of working families where all parents are in the workforce will be able to afford desperately needed early childhood services and programs. Well, the programs themselves will be able to compensate early educators with wages that are commensurate with peers in other fields. And the studies in this bill are crucial and it's so important to help us chart a course toward that future. And the second point is around quality and supports for early educators um, in the early education workforce. So, this bill takes a three-prong approach to providing supports and resources to build a pipeline, which is desperately needed into early education profession and retaining those early educators currently in the workforce. All three prongs are crucial to, build, to building a much needed increase in capacity in the early childhood programs that are so desperately in need. Um, the first would be funding for scholarships for the current workforce. And um, those really are what are creating a true pathway for those who have little or no education all the way to those who are working to attain their teacher licensure. Um, while we have scholarships that support early educators attaining an apprenticeship certificate associates and degree and a teacher license endorsement, we need additional funding to sustain those 95 recipients. And additionally, we're missing crucially a BA um, scholarship 
So folks end at their AA, they have no real um, substantive way and support of moving and attaining a BA, which is what is needed in order to get teacher licensure. Um, so the governor's budget is allocating 150 for this purpose. Um, and H171 includes 300,000 to fully fund the current program and expand to include a bachelor's program. And the second is the creation of a loan repayment program, which is designed for those um, newer early educators working in private community-based programs that already have a degree um, and their teacher license. Um, and this is really a crucial piece to retaining quality early educators. It's this population that can't afford their basic living expenses, car, food, rent, um, and their monthly student loan. Um, and unfortunately, they often choose to leave programs that they work in, finding positions um, that actually provide them a livable wage. And I can attest to that, it's happened to me three or four times um, as a public pre-K provider. Um, it's 1.8 million in funding to support loan the loan repayment program that's outlined in H171. Um, this will also help with that pipeline um, piece that we're talking about in attracting folks to the early education field. And thirdly, it's scholarship funds for prospective early childhood educators. And this is a program would be available to our higher education institutions to assist students who wish to attain an early childhood um, degree or early childhood special ed degree. Um, and it includes um, 400,000 to fund these scholarships which will make it affordable for students basically to um, at our state colleges and universities to obtain the early childhood um, or early childhood special ed degrees. Um, we also have some suggestions to strengthen H171. Um, it, so it sort of bears repeating that um, we strongly support this bill and we also would like to offer a few um, key points here. Um, in section one, we suggest including legislative intent language that highlights the legislative intent um, that no family spend more than 10% of their income on childcare and that early educators are compensated in a way that is commensurate with their peers in other fields. These goals are referenced in the financing study in section 14 um, of the bill, but we believe that they specifically should be named in the legislation in legislative intent of the bill as well. Also in section two, we suggest paying child care financial assistance program tuition to programs um, based on child's enrollment instead of attendance. This uh, change makes a huge difference in stabilizing the programs, supporting CCFAP access and care. Um, I also see firsthand the differences that this change could make. Um, though the administration has been incredibly generous in their approach to, you know, all of the absences that Melissa outlined that are allowed. Um, it still creates an additional burden on families and programs to justify absences that are not present for other families in care. Um, for instance, it's very difficult for programs. Uh, there are 15 provider closure days that were mentioned. Very difficult to encourage programs to um, really support their staff um, in taking care of themselves, allowing for vacation, proper vacation time, closures for holidays and um, professional development days. Um, 15 days might sound like a lot, but when you take into account all of the pieces that um, really create quality and um, incentives for your staff in a program, that makes it very difficult. Um, that's just one of those barriers. Um, in section 10, we suggest amending the reporting deadline so that the legislature 
has the report and recommendation by January 2023 in time to take action during the next legislative biennium and making sure that the funds will be available this year for both this study um, and the systems analysis in section 14. The financing study and the systems analysis are critical in achieving our vision for Vermont's early childhood system and really need to be prioritized in this bill. Uh, as I said before, we're basically at a really crucial time and we know that early education is essential to the economy and to the health and growth and development of our children. And I really see the fragility in this system and it's just been exacerbated um, through the pandemic. If we don't address affordability, access and quality, we're gonna start losing this industry altogether. Um, and that would truly be a cost that I really don't feel like we can afford at this point. Thank you. Thank you. As usual, clear, concise, and comes from a place of, uh, from where you work and we really appreciate uh, your insight. So thank you very much. Um, questions for Sonia. Go ahead, Senator Hardy. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Sonia, thank you for your testimony. Um, I have a clarifying question and then a, a further question about the scholarship stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You just mentioned section 10 and the report in section 10 and moving the date up. And I'm wondering if you actually meant a different section because I think the report in section 10 is due um, on November 30th, 2021. Is, is that yeah, I may have that wrong. I apologize if I do. Yeah. Okay. Are, you're talking about, are you talking about the financing study report yes. that's due in a few years? Okay. I think that's in a different section. I think that's. You moved it to uh, 2024. Right. That's in section 14. That 2020. 14. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Thank you for that correction. Sure. I just want to make sure I, this, since there are so many reports, I wanted to make sure. I know. You I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you're fine. It's confusing. I can't, I'm having a hard time keeping track of the reports. They all seem important, but when are they and all that? Um, and then I, I wanted to ask you because you're involved with particularly the professional development aspect of things um, and VC um, is, um, there was a, in Melissa's testimony, she made a comment about sort of getting these programs up and running and how that mm -hmm. may be challenging in the timeline with everything else that's going on. And I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on that and what role you and your organization would be playing in that and, and sort of how do you see the, the sort of logistics and administration of getting the program's going, is there a way to tack on to what's already happening that would make it easier or, yeah, so just your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I understand completely what you're saying about um, the time frame that it takes to, right, really create these programs, A, create the programs and then systematize them. And then again, if they need to go out for procurement, um, so um, then, you know, you have the, all of that time frame, and honestly, I, I can easily see where that sometimes takes up to nine months to a year. Um, you know, I guess it depends how, what the system is that's put into place, right? Um, and how simple or complicated we want to make the whole thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, the pieces around um, the current workforce is a, is a Obviously, those additional funds, um, that is an easy lift and really shouldn't take any time to implement. Um, but it's really, I believe what they're speaking about is the loan repayment specifically, which is a program that doesn't currently exist. Um, and the, sco the scholarship funds for early educators that are for the colleges specifically. And so, um, we would, of course, assist in any way that we could, um, but ultimately, and I, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of research already done to tap into in terms of um, just writing this bill um, about how the programs could and be structured and how they've worked in other states, um, you know, what's worked, what doesn't, um, who might be some of the potential um, folks that could administrate this work, right, once you've pulled it together. 
um, you know, in other words, who might actually uh, apply to um, procure this, <laughs> right, these funds. Um, I personally recommend using systems that are already in place, right? Um, whether you choose to use somebody like VSAC for the loan repayment program, um, you know, those kinds of things, I highly recommend that um, for expediency's sake, right? It is important. The sooner that we can pull these together, the better, um, you know, because, um, you know, without these other two pieces, honestly, you're really going to continue to just lose. Um, lose staffing. Uh, the loan repayment is something we've now been asking for for a few years. Um, and it's for folks who have, which are many, community-based um, qualified public pre-K programs, they really struggle to keep their early educators, their licensed teachers. Very difficult. And if you lose one, you you know, and you have 30 days to find another, there isn't one to find. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> um, so, you know, um, this pipeline of allowing folks to see early education as a profession that they can afford to, to go into for their livelihood, that piece is crucial. And so is the um, prospective because you know, folks, if they want to take the route of going out of high school and going straight into college, um, then coming out with the debt <laughs> is not proven to be helpful. So these are really programs that we see as not necessarily meaning to remain this way forever in time, but as a way of helping move us to a place where we are building this pipeline as well as supporting the current workforce to get the degrees and credentials they need, um, but not needing to be in place forever and ever in the same way. Right, I, I totally get it, I understand. I was just trying to figure out if there's an easier way to get them up and running to reduce the administrative burden. Um, so if you have, if you think of anything, let us know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Sonia. This is helpful. Um, as usual, <laughs> really, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're, we're gonna continue moving along. We've got three more folks and then our, we're gonna go through the bill with our ledge council. So um, let's see how far we can get. Uh, Dimitri Garter is here, a CEO of Global Z. Dimitri, thank you for being here. Well, good and morning. I do we have something from you on, uh, or do we have testimony from you? Uh, no, I didn't submit written testimony. I'm uh, happy to do so after the fact, but I wanted to focus on verbal testimony for now. Perfect, thank you. Good. Well, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to uh, present testimony to the committee this morning. Um, so I, we have some specific recommendations regarding uh, H.171, but before I get into those, I really wanted to frame our recommendations in the broader context of uh, why the business community is so supportive of investments in early childhood education. And I, I want to start by saying that this is a fairly remarkable place where the business community is right now. And uh, that really can't be understated. And uh, we feel so strongly about this issue that um, we're actually uh, favoring fairly bold moves and do favor um, ultimately a fully universal system, uh, recognizing that there are challenges to get there. Um, so I wanna frame that in the context. So first of all, I'm, uh, I'm Dimitri Garter, CEO of Global Z International. We're an IT company located in Bennington. Uh, I'm also a board member of the Vermont Business Roundtable. Um, the Roundtable is a group of uh, over 100 CEOs from across the Vermont business community. Uh, we tend towards the larger employers, but there's a fairly diverse membership or a nonpartisan group. And we're known for taking a, a deliberative approach to uh, systemic issues with a long view. Uh, the Roundtable has been working on early childhood education as one of our key policy priorities for over uh, 10 years. 
uh, because we believe that it's important for Vermont and I'll get into some of the specifics as to why. Um, and we're really looking at the long-term approach and the long-term outcomes from these investments. I'm also part of a business working group that's been looking at early childhood education over the past year. That group includes Michael Seaver, uh, the president of People's United Bank, Michelle Ash, the vice president of Twin, Twin Craft Skin Care, Adeline Druert, uh, the president of the Vermont Creamery, uh, Mark Foley, owner of Foley Services in Rutland, and Paul Millman, uh, the retired CEO of Chroma Technology. So we're a fairly diverse and broad group of business owners and CEOs. Uh, before I get into our thought process, I just want to start with a story about a conversation I had with one of our employees. Um, my company employs pr working professionals in the information technology sector. Most of them are highly educated, um, fairly well compensated. And one of my employees, when talking about early childhood education, said that if, if it weren't for the significant workforce flexibility that we provide as an employer, back when she started to have kids, she would have had to uh, exit the workforce altogether uh, because of the lack of access to affordable quality child care. And despite the flexibility that we offer to our employees, she chose not to have more kids due to the pressure and the stress and challenges of finding access to child care. So of course, this is a tragic story. Uh, this is a working professional in, who's educated in the IT field working for a company that provides significant flexibility. So in other words, really has everything going for her yet is still having challenges. So we can only imagine what um, other workers are, are facing as far as the challenges are concerned. So why does the business community care so much about early childhood education? How did we get to where we are? So first and foremost, there's the impact on the children and we all understand that the science shows that most brain development occurs before age three, and we understand the impact on outcomes later in life. Uh, and the science is clear on this. However, we also view this as an economic issue. So every employer that we speak with, every employer that's a member of the round table says the same thing. The number one challenge to doing business in Vermont is access to a skilled workforce. And that has been the case for a long time and we view investments in early childhood education as being the single most important thing that we can do as a state to address that issue. Uh, we believe that this uh, improves uh, workforce access by at least two generations of Vermont workers. Uh, it helps bring parents back into the workforce who are currently not in the workforce because of lack of access to childcare. It also gives the Vermont kiddos a better chance of having uh, access to quality jobs in the future due to all the outcomes I mentioned. And I would argue that there's also a third generation of workers that this impacts, which is the providers themselves. And um, previous testimony is really focused on the benefits to those folks and we fully support those, um, those arguments. We also believe that this would have a significant recruiting and retention impact on Vermont as well. So fully funding a universal uh, early ch childhood education system, we believe would have significant uh, attractive uh, benefits to the young families that we've been seeing leaving Vermont over time. And as a consequence of that, the business community has uh, ceased looking at this as a cost and looks at this as an investment in our future. And we believe that this is an investment that's going to have significant positive return. Uh, and the initial models are showing a three time uh, ROI or higher. Uh, however, it's been stressed that that's only true if we focus on quality, and we strongly agree with, uh, with those studies. As I said, we support a fully universal system, um, and we'd like to get there as soon as we can. And we also believe that Vermont could have significant first mover advantages, being the first in the nation to fully fund a universal child care system. And we believe that that has significant strategic advantages as well. So we support... Uh, investments in early childhood education. Um, this is a fairly remarkable place to be as a business owner to say that I represent a business group that believes so strongly that we need to do this, that we're willing to support it even if it means looking at new revenue. Now, I don't speak for everybody in the business community. Not everybody agrees with that. But broadly speaking, that's where the roundtable is. And uh, that's where our working group is. And uh, we feel strongly that there are some guidelines that um, we, we feel 
need to be communicated around our support there that frame uh, why we are where we are and, and how our support will continue moving forward. So the primary guidelines of our support are number one, urgency. So we knew that this was a problem before COVID. COVID, I think, increased awareness of the issue. And we know that this is going to be a problem, both in terms of the social and the moral and the economic outcomes for children and the workforce long term. So we were looking at the long term solutions here, but we need we believe we need to move quickly on this. Uh, another key component of our support is around the identification of funding sources. We believe strongly that those uh, that process needs to be prudent, rational, and pragmatic, and really needs to favor uh, neutrality and competitiveness, which means the spending needs to be as low as possible, but it needs to be governed and managed as well and should be aligned with the outcomes that we're looking for. And that leads me to the third and possibly the most important point for us, which is the governance and the accountability framework. And I'm going to get into my recommendations, but um, a, a lot of them are really framed around this idea of governance that we believe uh, that there should be significant business representation in a governance and accountability framework in early childhood education investments, particularly if, as anticipated, the business community is going to be looked at as a possible source for funding uh, for the program. And, and we believe our involvement in the accountability would be uh, really, really important to maintain uh, the outcomes that we're looking for. So specific recommendations on H.171, we fully support the bill. We think that it can be strengthened um, the business involvement in the working group uh, was, we believe, significantly weakened in the final version of the bill that the House passed. In particular, um, the working group uh, contemplated in Section 10 is temporary. It winds down at the end of this calendar year uh, and is really focused around the use of ARPA funds. We would favor a longer-term working group uh, that looks at the longer term financing and governance aspects of the system that includes significant business representation. There were some business groups named in a previous version of the House bill. We felt that that was stronger because it identified champions and stakeholders. Uh, and, and we would favor uh, language like that in, um, in back in H.171. Uh, we also strongly support the studies. We believe that they're critically important to uh, determine what the spending uh, is going to uh, amount to and look at ways of funding that. Um, so we agree with the, uh, the points that uh, the other groups made on that. And in particular, the timing uh, on the financing study, we agree with Sonia that uh, the end of uh, 2023 is too late. Uh, in the interest of urgency, we would prefer to see the report out uh, by January 1, 2023. And then finally, um, while we're looking ahead here, some, some thoughts about possible ways of funding early childhood education, again, in the context of this being a long view for us. Uh, we don't have specific prescriptive ideas regarding uh, specific financing mechanisms. However, we have established a set of guidelines that we believe are important to consider when establishing any funding sources, especially considering that we're looking at a fairly large investment here with the potential for new revenue. Um, we feel that it's critically important that the funding is sustainable and has uh, minimal overhead. In other words, leverages systems that we've already got. As Sonia pointed out, there are systems that are already in place that we can leverage to help improve um, the, the onboarding uh, of, of these programs. Uh, we believe strongly that the spending should be aligned with the benefits. So the benefits we see are largely in the area of workforce and aligning spending with um, the employer and the employee community uh, is philosophically consistent for us. And we also feel strongly that spending should be um, fair and evenly distributed. Uh, we oppose the idea of significant carve outs, whether it's uh, individual employers that fall into certain categories. We believe everybody should be in, employers, employees, we all benefit from the outcomes of the program and we believe we should be all um, responsible for the funding. Uh, and uh, lastly, we believe that the spending and the financing should be really tied to the outcomes that we're looking for. So the quality and the access of um, childhood education, those metrics should really be driving ongoing funding and governance decisions on a long-term basis. Um, 
and including uh, oversight by the business community. So I am grateful again for the time this morning and happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much. And, and again, if you can send your comments in writing, that will help us as we um, review all the testimony. We'll be happy and to. And mark up the bill. Thank you very much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that we continue along uh, at, because I'd like to have a little bit of time with our ledge council at the end for discussion. So I'm going to move to, um, I think, who is next? Sorry. Oh, Jordan Giaconia, thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So for the record, I'm Jordan Giaconia, the Public Policy Manager for Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. I'm very happy to be here. And again, appreciate the opportunity to offer some comments. Um, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't just open this up by just thanking you all for your tireless work uh, to sort of channel support to Vermont businesses, to families um, who are impacted by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. I know we're reaching the toward the end, hopefully anyway, of a very long and arduous session. Um, so I know schedules are tight and we're all, we're all very tired, but have just cannot express how much we've appreciated the, the care and the tenacity of this committee and the legislature writ large. So senators, again, thank you all. Um, you know, to that end, much like the round table, we tend to try to think ahead here and look long-term and see how we can build back better for our future. Um, so to that end, VBSR appreciates the opportunity to comment on H-171 and the value of an affordable, accessible, um, and accountable early child care system. And for clarity, we, we greatly, very strongly support this bill. Um, but first, a little bit about us. So VBSR, we're a statewide nonprofit business association with an enduring mission to create a just, thriving, and transformative economy that works for all people and the planet. Um, the majority of our members are small to medium-sized employers, roughly 35% employ 10 full-time employees or less, 65% employ 50-time uh, FTEs or less, um, and only about 6% or about 40 companies um, go above that into about the 300 or more FTEs. So we strive to act as an advocate and educator and a convener for our members, and we host a variety of webinars and series of educational events. We give voice to members on, uh, on the sort of pending policy issues that will impact our communities. Um, and more recently, we've also provided some financial assistance to struggling member businesses via our Small Business Resiliency Fund. Um, so being in touch with our membership, I think overall, and this is just a common theme that being that the COVID-19 pandemic has really brought to light a lot of major systemic challenges within our state that have been longstanding, but just cast a spotlight on them. And one of them is certainly the critical role that childcare plays um, in our economy, in our society overall. And we really see this as an essential form of infrastructure overall for a strong economy and a prosperous and equitable and just Vermont. Um, but then again, again, we still have a very longstanding problem being that over half of Vermont's youngest children don't have access to care. So what does this mean for the business community? I think Dimitri's done a wonderful job of casting some light on that. Um, you know, in the, in the workplace, parents are struggling to balance childcare and work that can oftentimes result in absenteeism and tardiness and distractions at work. Um, looking beyond that too, childcare access affordability challenges, they force a lot of parents to leave the workforce altogether, costing their salary, their potential wage growth, their retirement savings. Um, and not to mention that also takes away from household buying power. So one's ability to actively participate in our local economies um, and also takes away from our tax base too. So over time, a, a sort of a startling statistic was that over time, a parent who leaves the workforce loses up to four times their annual salary per year, and too often that burden falls on working mothers. Um, overall, employers need talented, focused, and reliable employees. So that lack of access to affordable and high-quality childcare can be a major hindrance to maintaining that workforce, um, and is, was identified consistently over the years as one of the top four obstacles to success for VBSR's members. Um, we usually can get that data via either a policy survey or a membership survey issued, um, one sort of alternating each and every year. Um, and more recently, uh, and I'm sure Morgan will speak to this as well, we did a, a post-COVID survey of um, our, our broader business membership. And at that time, a very, very large percentage, I believe it was around 42 or 43% of those business owners indicate that lack of childcare was a major challenge to their employees' ability to return to work. So this is a burden for the business community um, during a pretty challenging time. And it also, again, drastically widens historical gender inequities within our state. 
Um, a couple of other pieces too. I do want to mention that um, there's also some major di disparities in childcare access and affordability for Black, Hispanic, and Indigenous families. This is national data that I'm referring to, but more than half of Hispanic and uh, American Indian and Alaska Native families live in a childcare desert. Um, affordab affordability also is a major challenge, uh, especially for Black families. The average median income for a Black family with two young children um, they'd need to spend 56% of their income on childcare, which is a larger portion of total family income than that of any other group. So as our businesses and our families grapple with these challenges, providers are also trying to contend with a childhood um, educator workforce crisis here in Vermont as low wages, um, some lesser than competitive benefits and a lot of increased uh, health risk due to the pandemic are really, I think, costing us quite a bit. Um, and these programs are struggling to find and retain good staff. Um, and, I, and that is a major, major indicator for quality of childcare. Now, VBSR for a long time, as you all probably know, we've been real strong advocates for what we call livable jobs, um, which is a vision for having jobs for Vermonters that both provide strong wages and strong benefits. And the child care system is absolutely no exception there. Um, so we are very committed to building a, an equitable and sustainable child care system, one that's universally affordable, accessible, um, and values that tireless work of our and the expertise of our childhood educators. This, we see this as an economic and a moral imperative, um, one that promises not only to grow our economy and workforce, but also, um, as Demetri alluded to, but to attract and retain new families looking to make a home our little state. I can safely say as a, as a young and fairly new Vermonter uh, that one day hopes to, to build a family here that I'm deeply concerned about the cost of childcare. It's kind of one of the bigger barriers and one of my bigger hesitations about starting a family here. Um, that's just me kind of taking my VBSR hat off for a moment. But, um, you know, the proposed, so a couple of pieces we want to highlight here. So the proposed expansion for eligibility for the uh, CCFAP is outlined in H7171 would accommodate a much larger portion of Vermont's low to, um, low to moderate income workforce, many of whom actually qualify for partial subsidy, but and others may barely miss the cutoff for any subsidy at all, yet they're still facing significant financial hardship. Um, meanwhile, the bills propose scholarships for student loan repayment assistance programs um, for existing and prospective childcare providers. We can, again, see that as a really invaluable opportunity to create predictable employment conditions um, and also really create a critical tool for recruitment and retainment of, of high quality caregivers. So again, building out that local child care workforce. And as we've seen being strong advocates for, for minimum wage and for, for uh, robust, robust benefits like paid family leave, when you invest in your employees, your employees invest in your business or in this case, um, in your child care facilities and, and those that you care for. A couple other pieces I wanna make up really abundantly clear here that uh, VBSR members are deeply, deeply invested in this issue, and we are committed to being part of the solution, but we cannot do that alone. A lot of our members, and again, as you can see, we kind of represent a fairly diverse swath of the, of the business community. They've taken a lot of different approaches to trying to address childcare challenges. So some have offered on-site childcare facilities, others have provided subsidies to help their employees cover costs. Others offer flexible work schedules and maybe a hybrid and remote work opportunities to accommodate the needs of working parents. But while these are all really admirable solutions and I think are part of why I'm so proud of our membership and proud to represent them, um, they're only a patch fix for a much broader and more systemic problem. So what we really need to do here is drive home solutions that are gonna involve both state and employer investment. And we have to do that in a way that's not prohibitive, prohibitive excuse me, for our smaller businesses and startups. And frankly, that begins with studying the problem. Um, so when a business is faced with a major challenge, the responsible thing to do is to investigate options and to understand the repercussions before you move forward. The financing study is as detailed in H-171 would help to speak not only to the challenges that businesses and employees face in accessing affordable childcare, but also to inform creative ideas, I think that could maximize those communities and economic benefits of childcare reform. Um, that said, this study needs to happen more quickly than is outlined um, in the bill passed by the House. So given the immense pressure that businesses are under and the urgency to address this crisis as our little state looks to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, a report back in 2024 is frankly much too late. Uh, we ask that the Senate uh, amend the final reporting deadline for that study to January 1st, 2023, to ensure that the legislature has all of the data and the tools necessary at the outset of the next legislative biennium to get started in tackling this problem. Um, you know, our, our businesses, our children, our families, 
we frankly can't, we can't wait another three years for policymakers to gather the information that they need to advance long-term solutions to this long-standing problem. Um, additionally, we also ask that the, the funds be made available this year. And the reason being is namely to allow consultants to start working on those studies um, and get things started sooner rather than later. You know, let's just gather the information that we need to grow to address the challenges that we face, but let's do it at a pace that's commensurate with the needs of Vermonters. And only then can we make really truly strategic and impactful investments. Um, I also wanted to mention too, that I appreciated Dimitri's comments as it related to business representation and advisory committees generally. We were really appreciative of that very robust language that was originally housed um, in the House bill. Um, so to what extent practicable, we want to make sure that the business community is, is actively, um, so they have this active opportunities to represent themselves in this decision-making process. As I mentioned, this is going to be a shared investment. So let's make sure that we're all, we're all at the table. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your time, for your consideration of these comments. And again, to just reiterate our strong support for H171 and happy to field questions. Thanks, uh, thank you so much. That was very, that was comprehensive. And I do want to move right along, but I can't resist one comment. And that when you when you went to your personal comment uh, about two or three sessions ago, I did a full uh, I did a whole set of interviews with remote workers in our state, and then a couple of folks who were interested in coming to the state. And what was the number one need? It wasn't. It was it was strange because I thought it was going to be access to internet. It was child care, so you <laughs> you fit the you fit the data uh, set. Um, much thank much you. appreciated, Senator. Yeah, thank you for your comments, Morgan. I'm going to turn to you and ask uh, for your um, testimony, and I know we also have it on our web page. Thank you, and thank you all for having this on the web page. And your comments are are really critically important to us. Good morning, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee for having me. Um, my name is Morgan Nichols, and I'm the State Director of Main Street Alliance of Vermont. We thank the committee and the legislature writ large for all that they are doing to support Vermonters through this challenging time. And we thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of Main Street Alliance of Vermont's small business owners who believe that when policy serves our workers, our families, and our communities, it serves to create a broader and more equitable economy where our businesses can thrive. Main Street Alliance of Vermont businesses represent the cornerstone of our communities, the places where we come together, and it is these businesses that help to shape the identity of our state. Many of our members are the smallest businesses here in Vermont, including our many sole proprietors. These businesses all harness their entrepreneurial spirit and creativity to make a living, deliver goods and services, provide good jobs, and contribute to our economy. COVID-19 has laid bare um, the cracks within our systems and the glaring lack of high quality, affordable and available childcare has had crippling impacts on our membership. We strongly support H-171 and know that when implemented, this policy will have positive and intersectional impacts throughout our state. Our membership are directly impacted by the lack of childcare. From the business owner whose employee can't return to work because there are no available childcare spaces in their community, to the son who's had to make the crushing decision to leave his multi-generational family business for a higher paying job to afford childcare for his infant. The lack of strong, vibrant and equitable childcare system has impacts on every rung of the economic ladder. We also know that the lack of childcare has had substantive barriers for women, um, creates substantive barriers for women and women of color in the workforce, as we have seen both here in Vermont and across the country, with over 2.3 million women leaving the workforce nationally, and at its highest, women making up 73% of Vermont's unemployed. Decades of progress towards gender equity have been undone practically overnight. Uh, as Jordan mentioned, and I'll, I'll, I'll also reiterate, in a survey issued by Main Street Alliance of Vermont and Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, 42.7% of business owners indicated that a lack of childcare is a challenge for their employees' ability to return to work. As we not only recover from COVID-19, but also grapple with our state's shrinking demographics, the investment in our childcare infrastructure proposed in H-171 will also help to further attract and retain young working families to Vermont, and this will only help our economy recover more quickly. Within the last year, I've had the privilege to speak to many women business owners from throughout Vermont, women, women who have been doing everything they can to, 
um, to make it work. Um, and I often return, <laughs> refer to this as the Vermont hustle, um, juggling their business, juggling their families and their households and doing what they can to care for themselves during this pandemic. Um, and for all of them, childcare comes up as a significant barrier for their ability to sustain and or grow their business. And I just want to share a little story. I, and I just also want to say, I got this story last night at 1030 last night, because that was the only time this, this business owner um, had the opportunity to, to write this. When the pandemic hit, the most shocking thing about being pregnant, a solopreneur, and a mother to a three-year-old wasn't the overnight cancellation of all my in-store tastings, events, and eventually my business, or the horrifying unknowns of giving birth during a global pandemic. I ran with the punches, punches, and by the time I gave birth, six weeks after the state originally shut down, I had a return to work plan. <clears throat> I'd be back at the Stowe Farmer's Market by August or September, and my three-year-old would be in preschool at the same time. What forced me to shut down my business was the permanent closure of my daycare two weeks after I gave birth. Finding a spot for my daughter that mirrored the care I gave her at home, primarily outside and child-led, had taken eight months of, 18 months of searching, interviewing, and trying out a few daycares that weren't the right fit. I knew I couldn't um, take that on again with a newborn in tow while trying to run my business and balance the pandemic. Something had to give, and it was my career. We know that Vermonters need a child care solution as soon as possible, as we've all indicated, both Dimitri and Jordan. Um, in, order to, in order for this bill to move forward efficiently and effectively, we support Let's Grow Kids' call to move the financing study up to January 1st, 2023, um, and to ensure that it has funding to support those who are conducting these studies. We must take the opportunity to champion bold solutions that, de de that develop a sustainable child care infrastructure so that families have the opportunity access to affordable and high quality childcare and that our valued early childhood edu educators receive sustainable and equitable compensation. We thank you so much for the opportunity today and thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, thank you very much. And you, the, the stories that you brought to us, there was the other story that you didn't read, but um, it do does make it real for us and we appreciate that. And we, we need, um, Arthur sauce back and Lady Boss sauce back. It's very good. It's very good. And it I'm is excellent. That up. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how often I hear those stories um, time and time again. I'd lose childcare, my business closed. So thank you again for the time and opportunity. Yes, thank you. Uh, and we hear you. Um, can I just will ask one question and then uh, we're going to take a quick break. And uh, I think it's to Dimitri and Jordan. You commented on the uh, section of the bill that had business uh, folks involved in the working group. Can you uh, indicate to us the section that you're talking about? Uh, yeah, this is section 10. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah which includes the working group uh, working with DCF and um, building bright futures. Thank you, okay. I, I guess it was narrowed down. Uh, if, once you start building a working group and everyone wants to be interest, in it, it makes it difficult, but it's certainly something for us to look at. And we appreciate uh, your interest in this. It, it, it's really refreshing to have so much business interest and what we're doing here with uh, childcare. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so committee, uh, we're going to take a five minute break. Uh, we'll, so, well, it'll be six. So come back at 1040, please. Nellie will go on break and then we're gonna come back for uh, to work with Katie on H171. And then after that, we have some more testimony um, from yesterday on 120 and 132. So 1040.